Hello, I'm Stuart Crane, and welcome to this session, which is part three days of adventures into the ecosystem future. I'm director of the Business Ecosystem Alliance, co-founder of Thinkers50, and we're delighted once again to be partnering with the Higher Model Institute on this virtual event, exploring the very latest thinking and best practice in the field of business ecosystems. We're excited that people from more than 50 countries worldwide have signed up for these sessions. So welcome to you, wherever you are in the world, from Slovenia to Singapore and beyond. Please send in your comments, thoughts, questions, and queries at any time during the sessions. So our next session over the next 45 minutes brings together three of the world's leading researchers into the realities and challenges of business ecosystems. Making new sense of ecosystems, we have Elizabeth Altman, Douglas Hanna, and Shiva Agarwal. Liz is an Associate Professor of Management at the Manning School of Business at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and a Research Affiliate at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. She served as a Visiting Assistant Professor at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and a Visiting Scholar at Harvard Business School. Liz is co-author of the book Workforce Ecosystems, published by MIT Press and available from the usual places. Liz is joined by Doug Hanna, who is an Assistant Professor of Strategy and Innovation at Boston University's Questrom School of Business. His research examines the emergence of innovation ecosystems and firm strategy in ecosystem settings. Uh, Doug uh, was named by Poets and Quants, no less, in the top 50 best un undergraduate professors. And we're joined by Shiva Agarwal. Uh, Shiva is a, an assistant professor of management at the University of Texas at Austin's McCombs School of Business. Before entering academia, Shiva was a software developer for Microsoft and a consultant for Boston Consulting Group. And bo both those positions have influenced her research into strategies used by companies in platform-based ecosystems and the role of interdependent structures in explaining the performance of a complementer. So we're going to start by just finding out a little bit more about uh, everyone's research. Can I ask you to go first, Shiva, and, and just share the kind of focus uh, of your work? Stuart. Now, hi, everybody. I'm Shiva Agarwal. My research primarily focuses on technology-based ecosystems and specifically platform-based ecosystems. And in my research, I study these ecosystems both from the perspective of complementers as well as the platform owner or the central orchestrator of the ecosystem. When I look at the complementers, the main questions that I'm trying to understand from my research is, what are the factors that affects complementers' performance in an ecosystem? And from the perspective of platform owners, the key the question that I'm focusing on is basically how do these platform owners manage these complementers and man govern these complementers to manage the tension between value creation and value appropriation. And my work has primarily been building on Liz or Anna's piece on the platform management where she talks beautifully about how governance of platforms is different than that of the other traditional supply chain because in platforms you really need to shepherd the complement as rather using another hierarchical governance mode and in my research actually i'm showing some of the tools used by these platform owners for example in case of ios ecosystem apple uses awards as a way to manage the tension between value creation and value appropriation Traditionally, when we think about awards, we think that awards should be given to best performers. But in act in case of Apple, actually, they are not giving it to the best performer. They are giving it to the competitor, the second best performer, to reduce the dominance of complementers. So there are these it's interesting tools that these platform owners are using, and that's what I'm focusing on in my research. Thank you. And, and Doug, can you t tell us about uh, about your work? Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me and, and having having this conversation. So my name is Doug Hanna. I'm at uh, Boston University's Questrom School of Business. Before here, I was actually, I got to spend some time at University of Texas with Shiva. And prior to that, I was at Stanford uh, University where I got my, my PhD from the engineering school. Um, so my work looks at ecosystem and ecosystem dynamics, especially in settings that are undergoing digitization. And it's uh, I've worked across a number of different settings, solar, medical device, uh, advertising industry, consumer services. Um, 
And one of my, I think my big interest, my focus um, is on the entrepreneurial angle. So I'm particularly interested in understanding how entrepreneurs and executives identify new opportunities uh, and, and, and how they sort of navigate these rapidly changing spaces. Because when you think about digitization, it often allows sort of an unbundling of supply chains and an introduction of sort of new interdependencies and new niches that can be filled, which opens the opportunity space, but at the same time, then makes it very difficult to understand what needs to be done to, to capture a given opportunity. So as a, as a sort of example, um, a, a line of work on the emergence of the solar industry, and solar took off, residential and commercial solar um, took off in the United States in, in about a, a decade or decade and a half ago, in large part because of the introduction of digital mapping uh, data and digital mapping technology. And what that allowed was that systems, solar systems could actually be designed and sold remotely. And so there was a, a sea change in the industry where previously it had been installers doing sort of kitchen table sales. And then we shifted to a model where companies were actually designing and selling solar systems centrally and then local partnering with local installers to install them. And this saw this sort of this hockey stick upward growth um, because it allowed sort of cost reductions and things like this, which is very, very cool, but at the same time introduced a lot of complexity in the ecosystem. We see the same thing in medical. So there's been a big push in value-based care and the sort of hope of reducing healthcare costs um, and improving patient outcomes by leveraging new technologies. So you have smartphones and you have different digital communication platforms that can connect doctors and patients. And that has a lot of promise, but at the same time, understanding how to structure these complex interdependencies between doctors and hospitals and patients and insurers and medical records providers and all of these different actors becomes extremely complicated. Um, and, and so this is, I think, the big theme in my work is that when we have digital digitization, when we have fundamental industry shifts like this, it opens new opportunities by unbundling previous activities um, and by sort of allowing more complex business models. But at the same time, that makes things really complicated. And so that's a big theme in my work is understanding what we can do as executives and as entrepreneurs to navigate these environments safely. And uh, Doug, you, you did work about resilient supply chains around COVID as well. Yeah, and I'm I'm hope the conversation will get into that because I think this is a really interesting area too of how digital platforms, but more broadly, um, uh, ecosystem sort of structures can allow supply chain resilience in a world that is you know subject to constant disruptions. Liz, what was the short the short story on your work? Short story. <laughs> you know that's you know that's difficult. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you again, Stuart, for ha having us here. Um, I love both Doug and Shiva's work, and I'm thrilled to actually be on a panel with them. So, as I was thinking about this, I decided actually I'm going to give you super short uh, stories about a number of different projects I'm working on, in the hopes that that will spark questions and discussion and areas for kind of continued. Um, conversation. So Stuart, as you mentioned, uh, I've recently published a book on workforce ecosystems. And in that case, that's joint work with Slow Management Review and Deloitte. And it, what's interesting to me about that is it blends the conversations we have about platforms and ecosystems with this broader conversation of future of work and what is a workforce and who and what is in a workforce. And I will say I'm thrilled that uh, before the generative AI kind of explosion, we were already starting to talk about what is the role of technology as a participant in an ecosystem. Uh, and so I think that has a lot of potential to continue. We have some frameworks that we've been thinking about. So this notion of kind of what is a workforce ecosystem is one. I've also gone back to some original, so I'm on sabbatical this year. So thinking a lot about research projects and what I'm working on, product to platform transitions. So. There was a 2017 article I did with Andre Haju about product-based uh, organizations and how they become platforms or platformization. And that also leads often to conversations of hybrid organizations because companies don't go just from traditional hierarchical to platform. They go to traditional hierarchical plus platform most of the times, most of the time. And that has serious both strategic and organizational implications. Uh, I've done some work recently with the United Nations Development Program with Frank Nagel at HBS. We just last week published a teaching note 
with a Harvard Business School case on networks of ecosystems. And that's related to doing innovation in a very decentralized way. So the United Nations Development Program has an accelerator lab network. It was originally in 60 countries. I think it's in 90 or more now, uh, serving about 115 countries. And the notion is using local ecosystems connected through a central mechanism, a network of ecosystems to drive forward innovation towards the sustainable development goals, the UN's SDGs. And it's been a very successful effort. And I think it's fascinating and companies, both large and small, can learn a lot from it. Um, I've done some complementary strategy work that work that complements Shiva and Doug's work. Uh, I've thought a lot recently, two more areas. One is on leadership in ecosystems. So again, I think we think about ecosystems often as black boxes of organizations, but thinking about what does that mean for those who are leading in those organizations, doing some work with one of my doctoral students who's actually a colonel in the US Army. He has a lot of experience in leadership of different types. So thinking about when you're in these highly interdependent network connected ecosystem environments, what does that mean for leaders and thus managers? And we talk about what are the practical implications? I think there are a lot of practical implications there. And finally, I'm thinking much more about policy implications. I'm just starting as a non-resident um, fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington and starting to write more about policy implications. There'll be a working paper coming out in September um, not necessarily ecosystem specific, but of course all of this work is related. And in that case, the work is on gen the persistent gender imbalance in domestic labor uh, in households. And why it's interesting is how AI and emerging technologies is starting to affect that and how we, we see the future of that. So again, it's not ecosystem forward in terms of the work, but I would argue that there's absolutely no way that these changes are going to occur unless we're operating within ecosystems. And the research I'm doing on ecosystems and platforms, I'm bringing to bear, I'm thinking about these other problems. So that may be of interest to this conversation. Not so short, but there's there's my kind of big overview that we can pick from if anyone's interested in any of those topics. The, uh, the previous session we had looked at uh, product platform transitions. So if people want to look that up, that involve a case study of Roche Diagnostics in, uh, yes. in France. Um, is it, I mean, it seems to me there's kind of a rising tide of interest in ecosystems. But as you, as you talk to people in the academic world and in the, in the business world and the, the public sector world, do people understand the language you're using, the language of ecosystems now in a, in, a, in a more enlightened and different way than they did a few years ago? Shiva, when you, when, when you talk to people, do, do people understand complementers and orchestrators? So actually, when I started looking at this work, it was hard for people to understand what do we mean by interdependencies because many of these interdependencies are implicit and people don't see that unless or until they get hit by it. But now, as I'm talking more to people in the, in the industry, I think they are aware about what is a complement of what role they are playing. So there is this growing awareness around the roles, specific roles that they are playing in the ecosystem. But it was not the case seven, eight, eight years back. The rising tide of interest, Doug? Yeah, so I, I think I have um, maybe a similar experience to Shiva. When I started researching and presenting in this space, there were some wonderful uh, senior, very experienced, very good researchers uh, publishing here, but it was a very small community. And um, I think one of the challenges that you have whenever there's a sort of, you know, if you're in the, 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 the lead tip of the spear in an intellectual area is, um, is proving the constructs and communicating the constructs. And I think, you know, the three of us are lucky to follow in some pretty big footsteps of, of, of senior folks who were able to do that. And, and now, I, you know, I hope that we're trying to pick up, pick up the charge. The interesting kind of dynamic, though, is that I think ecosystems have gotten so hot that uh, we often kind of the terminologies become relatively diffuse and it's being applied to a lot of different types of phenomenon that are very 
different in terms of their underlying economics. And so it is less clear sometimes what type of ecosystem someone is talking about and how we can leverage the insights from one into the other. So I, I don't, you know, I, I think the challenge is different. We no longer need to prove that this is an important point, but we still actually really need to be very clear about what we're talking about and why and what type of ecosystem it is. So ac academics have developed a very precise vocabulary but when it encounters the the world the world of practice, executives are, are kind of a high hijack it and take it wherever they want. P possibly, I mean, yes, certainly. But at the same time, I think ecosystems. I think two two responses to that. I think this is one area where academics are really trying to learn from, in many cases, from industry. And a lot of the really interesting ecosystem understanding is coming out of industry. And we're the ones sort of in the back, actually one step behind trying to consolidate some of that knowledge. I also think that academics are just as much to blame for this diffusion uh, and, and the sort of lack of clarity around topics because we are interested in this phenomena and there are lots of different ways interdependencies can manifest. Um, and so, so uh, that is actually happening in the theory and in the research as well, not just between theory and practice. I also think as uh, large companies, at least in the United States and many other countries like Uber or Airbnb, as they've come up as platforms, it becomes easier to have these you know, well-known examples where you can start to, or you know, smartphones, Android, Apple, be able to talk about developer communities. People understand my phone doesn't work unless it has apps. If it's raining and it's New Year's Eve and I am standing in New York City and I can't get a car, that's a problem with you know, balancing the platform. And so I think as we as academics have more real world examples in that we can explain and use, the whole conversation becomes a lot easier. I think when all of us started eight, 10 years ago talking about this and we said, I'd like to talk about platforms, it was either platform shoes often or um, platform chips and just an assumption that you were talking about technology. So for me, this movement from we're talking about um, purely technology to new business models, changing approach to thinking about business strategy. That's been a shift that we can use examples to show. Let's go back to the language. A word that's used a lot, I think Shiva used it earlier, was, is, is orchestrators. Can, can, can we talk about that? Are we all comfortable with that as a, as, as a word in, in the ecosystems space? Shiva? So initially it started with orchestrator because most of the ecosystems that I typically study is the platform-based ecosystem where there is a central authority and that central authority governs the rules and actions of the complementer. So I think in the platform ecosystem, that word is probably fine to use, but as Doug suggested, it's there are many, many various types of ecosystems and there probably that use a word orchestrator might not be clear. And Doug's initial work actually suggests that actually there are ecosystems where there is no central authority. So there's a lot of variance there and we need to be very clear in terms of which ecosystem we are talking about and what role does a central player plays in that ecosystem when we use that word. Yeah, I think picking up on that, if I can, I think this is one of the really interesting, uh, there are lots of different ways to sort of segment our thinking on this, but one of the really interesting ways is the degree to which there's clarity around who owns and who orchestrates. Um, so in a lot of Shiva's work, looking at um, uh, mobile and telecommunications platforms, you know, Apple owns iOS and we're, nobody's really going to dispute that. And there may be a lot of agency and room for complementers to maneuver, but at the end of the day, Apple is the powerful player in that space. In other industries, um, even, you know, in healthcare in the United States, we don't have a single powerful player in the solar industry. There are lots of firms who view themselves as powerful players and they are aligning their own sets of complementers, introducing their own interdependencies. And there's actually 
a lot of wiggle room in terms of how that's structured. Um, and I do think that that introduces some pretty different dynamics because rather than understanding how to optimally structure an ecosystem, we really need to actually start asking questions about, well, who's even in this and, and who is in control um, and how do they interact? And so that's, that is, I think, one, one key point of difference between Shiva's work and my work, where I tend to be in these spaces where uh, nobody's going to give you the same answer if you ask who's actually running the show. This is the who's the sun and who's the planet discussion, and everybody thinks they're the sun. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to just jump in here for a moment also. Um, Shiva mentioned our paper I have with Mike Tushman and Frank Nagel, the Annals article. Um, we talk about shepherding ecosystems. So I also have written papers titled Orchestrating Eco e Workforce Ecosystems. But when we were talking, when we were doing the very theoretical work of the Annals paper, we were having, we were struggling with the problem that, so the reason we jump, most of us jump to orchestration is because it's not managing. So we want a lighter touch than managing because it gets this control question, right? Typical hierarchy, traditional hierarchy, you have control, um, ecosystem, you have much less control, but yet still some control. So we kind of figured we'd notch it down one and we get to orchestrating, which means kind of pull things together. But when you think about like a symphony orchestra, for example, um, the conductor has a lot of control. And the most importantly, the musicians don't have, and I'm maybe speaking out of turn as not a classical musician, but they don't have a ton of autonomy and a lot of agency with what they can do. They're reading music that prescribes to them what to play, although they can have some interpretation on that. Um, shepherding, the sheep have a lot of control over where they go, right? And I did get in trouble by an editor who said, are you implying the sheep have more agency than musicians? And I said, I'm not answering this question. But, uh, so, but to this notion of a shepherd where sheep have lots of agency and they can really move around a lot within prescribed boundaries, we thought was a pretty good image. But then Reed Hastings and Aaron Meyer in No Rules Rules, their book, I think did a great job of addressing this. They had hit the same issue. And they said, when they, they use the term orchestration, but they think about a jazz band. And in that case, there is um, much more improvisation and musicians have much more um, autonomy in what they play and how they play it. And so I've become much more comfortable with the notion of orchestration if you take it out of classical music and out of the idea of a conductor orchestrating, but you have this broader notion of orchestration um, that gives a little more agency to the players. So that's my view on orchestration and why I've kind of come around to orchestration as okay. So all, all, all orchestras and conductors aren't created equal. Correct. Well, all music isn't created equal, nor are all ecosystems. And so I think when you start to think about it that way, and back to uh, what my colleagues were saying, there are you know, different contexts, different types of ecosystems. You can use the word, but I think it is important that we recognize one of the key factors here, kind of overriding the whole conversation, is varying levels of control within an ecosystem. And I've been thinking a lot about that because that has a lot to do with leadership and policy making when you get into these conversations about who controls what within an ecosystem. Uh, with shepherding, everybody talks about the shepherd and the sheep, but they, t they tend to miss out the dog. Absolutely. I think I actually CK Pralad used to talk about the leader as a, as a shepherd. Oh, well, and that makes sense. And I will go back and look at the, uh, that work then, especially yeah. because the awards, one of the awards that I think is named after him. Yeah, the um, another issue with ecosystems is their longevity. How long do and and should they last? What what, what are your varying views on views on that, Shiva? 
Yep. So again, as I study platform-based ecosystems, which tends to have this winner-take-all dynamics, most of my work has looked at these ecosystems that last decades. Like my empirical study is primarily on a smartphone ecosystem. So longevity is not typically when the orchestrator of the ecosystem designed these ecosystem, they have that longevity in mind. But recently, my work has also started looking at how the dynamics of ecosystem shifts over time. So initially, when the platform owner is designing the ecosystem, he's more worried about the network effects. But the importance of network effects goes down after a certain time, because now once you have a million app, one extra app doesn't make a lot, doesn't change your value proposition significantly. So my work has now started looking at how the dynamics of ecosystem shifts over time and the focus of the orchestrator shifts over time. Initially, they are more worried about how do I get these complementers on the space, but as ecosystem progresses, they are more worried about complementers dominance. So there are complementers such as Epic Game, which are pushing Apple. And Apple recently actually had a code battle with them and they were able, they were forced to reduce their fees from 30% to 15%. So there are these complementers and ecosystem platform owners that gets into this tension that becomes more prominent as ecosystems mature. I think so if I may mean. quickly add to this, I think this is really interesting because um, you mentioned that some of the complementers gain dominance or gain control and the platform needs to be concerned about that. On the flip side, early in an ecosystem, so even Apple when they were starting with accessories, for example, needed certain complementers, right? They actually went to complementers and said, please make this accessory for our phones to make it work. But then as the ecosystem grew, every one of those individual, and so in that case, they, the platform had a little bit less control and the complementer had a little more control. We're the only one in the world who can make this type of accessory for you. Therefore, we'd like to do it under these terms or this way. As time went on and more and more accessory providers and others came into the ecosystem, each individual ecosystem uh, complementer uh, lost control and the platform gained control. Right. So that was the reverse scenario, same ecosystem, actually, but different scenario, depending on which type of products or services you're talking about. Completely agree with you, Liz. So again, the focus here is that the this dynamics between platform owner Change. and complementers shifts over time. And platform owner cannot use the same shepherding tool over time. They need to change their focus. So initially they were more worried about which complementer will join me. How will they add my value proposition? But later on, they need to be worried about dominance as well or, or the reverse scenario. And so what and what I love about this is, is you know, you're, you're both highlighting the fact that these, we don't know how these stories are going to play out. And often in the beginning, there is a fight for control. And we know that when firms are able to establish control early on in settings where there are strong network effects, they become big, right? So we have Google antitrust case going on right now, um, which is a which is an illustration of this. And um, and a lot of the big platforms that we understand, you know, we we looking back at them, we can we can look at the sort of dynamics of these stories and the fight for control early on. But a comment popped up here, which I think also highlights a really interesting part of this, which is that we don't always get settings where that platform ever has control, right? Um, and so this, this comment here references uh, sort of cra craftsmen and the collaborations between craftsmen. And I think when we think about longevity, this can be, uh, this is a really interesting and wonderful insight in that we often have repeated collaborations between actors and interdependence between actors where the interface or the trade-offs and the interdependence might be sort of specified, but there's no explicit ownership of that control. And there's not necessarily an ability for a platform owner to extract profit. Um, and from a social perspective, it's not really clear that we want it. So as an interesting, just to sort of give a, a concrete example here, um, I mentioned that I've got work looking at um, uh, personal protective equipment, medical devices early in the pandemic. So in the United States um, and, and across the globe, when COVID hit, there was this massive need for, for masks and gowns and respirators and ventilators and all sorts of different, very complex to very simple medical supplies. 
And, uh, and supply chains were absolutely overwhelmed. And what we saw across the globe was this, this entrepreneurial wave of entry where small groups, hundreds of thousands of individuals, thousands of groups got together to produce this stuff. And one of the key ways that they were able to do this, because don't forget, we knew nothing about this disease. We were all locked in our homes. There was very, you know, everything was disrupted. But people were still able to share information and coordinate with one another and develop actually really complex supply chains, de novo supply chains, using Slack. So Slack, as a communication tool and as a fundamental platform to allow this coordination, was absolutely indispensable in this response. But it wasn't, I mean, Slack, my understanding is they were giving out licenses to these groups, just saying, hey, you're doing good work, we're going to help you organize. And there wasn't necessarily an effort to actually control that interface. And I think that you see this increasingly where you have, in the world that we're getting into, there is the ability to collaborate uh, and the ability to have really dynamic sort of pairings and 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 groups emerge that may actually be quite ephemeral. Uh, and I think understanding those is really neat. And it's it's actually a very different setting than than what you know we've been talking about so far, as as Shiva and Liz are alluding to. Let's take take some questions from uh, pe people watching. Yanka, uh, Doug, Doug's highlighted her, her note, but the point she seems to be making is that eco our knowledge and uh, understanding of ecosystems can get bogged down in with the global tech giants. In fact, ecosystems are fairly universal against across organizational life and activities. I just want to highlight one one word there. I don't necessarily know that we're bogged down. I think that understanding <laughs> Pre preoccupied. Tech, yes, that's and that's absolutely fair. I think understanding these tech giants and the role that they have in our economy and our society is it's it simply we cannot not do it. It is so so critical. Um, but at the same time, it is a different phenomenon than these more latent. I love the word Yank is using here. Potent, um, uh, uh, equally potent, uh, quieter ecosystems are all around us, and understanding how those operate, I think, is is a big frontier for us as researchers. Yeah, and I think as so, we've worked very hard to have a wide range across industry, across size of organization, so entrepreneurial firms and larger firms, and around the world in the examples. Um, that we use in is, you know, again, the United Nations example is one that I like. It's a, you know, it's not a for-profit firm, obviously. Um, and yet they're using ecosystem techniques, I think, brilliantly to address some of the world's thorniest problems. Um, and I think, you know, there are some other examples I know. I, we write about a company called um, Applause that has a uh, this community of U testers, which is a million testers around the world um, that they use for software and, and device testing. So in that case, they're serving um, tech companies, but it's it's, um, it's a different type of a structure. So I, I completely agree that we should be looking at other ecosystems. One of my other favorite examples is the Mayo Clinic and their innovation ecosystem. Um, so I think we see healthcare, um, financial services, there's incredible things happening in financial services right now, which is a really interesting area to be studying as well. So, Yeah, some, somebody else watching says, I think it's probably for Shiva, because I think you kind of, you, I think you, answer, you answered it to some extent, which, which boundaries need to be put in place to prevent platforms becoming uh, uh, monopolies? Uh, there is a pervasive trend towards winner-takes-all effects. So that's a very oligopolies was the word I was struggling over. That's a very pertinent question, and that is something that the, both the policymakers and uh, everybody is struggling with. But I actually think that we have to think about these platforms from a slightly different perspective. So if you think about Apple and Google, I agree that they are dominating the economy, but at the same time, they have provided tools that is flourishing millions and millions of app developers. So I don't think that we need to really, if we go very hard on that, then that can affect the innovations that is coming out from millions and millions of app developers. So there has to be a balancing act needs to be done that they, we don't want them to become a superpower, but at the same time, we want them to play the role that they are currently playing, which is to foster innovations in many different parts of the world. Yeah, I guess I would also point uh, 
viewers towards Annabelle Gower's work. I mean, some of our other colleagues as well, but I know Annabelle has done a bunch of work with the EU um, particularly. And if you kind of look for her and look for her work, you can see a number of, she's contributed on a number of white papers, a number of policy papers, and it's a really good starting point to start to understand some of the policy implications and policy questions around these platforms. So just as one set of resources. I think Michael Jacobides as well, who I believe is part of, um, yes, part of this. Yes, same. This week. Right. Yeah, my, Michael's work's really good, yeah. the um, What about your work with the solar industry, Doug? Can you, can you tell us a bit about, a bit about that? Uh, gosh, I could tell you quite more than a bit, uh, papers and dissertations worth. Um, let's see, uh, what what's, specifically what, would you like what, to know? What's, what's the ecosystem highlight? The ecosystem highlight there, I think, is, is a little bit of what I alluded to earlier with, um, with new, new opportunities emerging, um, where, so th the two changes that were really big in the solar industry that allowed it to grow, one was, um, one was the availability of data, as I mentioned, which allowed sort of an unbundling of, of the supply chain. The other was actually a quirk of tax law. So, um, starting in around 2007 in the United States, um, uh, companies could claim 30% of the cost of an installed system uh, uh, as a tax credit. Um, but the problem was these installers didn't have the tax liability and the, the customers didn't have the tax liability to make that worth it. And so this ended up introducing a novel business model, which was bundling these, uh, these, these um, uh, tax benefits into portfolios and actually selling them to banks and what was basically a mortgage-backed security, uh, an equity-backed security. And this was happening around 2007 and 8, 9, which was not a great time to be selling complex financial instruments. But I, what I like about this is, uh, and basically what this what this tax uh, uh, in, in incentive did was it allowed these companies to introduce a lease model, which reduced the upfront cost to zero. And that's what caused, in, in big part, the hockey stick upward growth of the industry. But what I really like about this is when we go to these early emergent kind of settings, you see tremendous opportunity in terms of novel business models, novel organizational forms, completely new constellations of players. And so in that particular setting, you had, you know, big banks all of a sudden were in this space in a way that they had never played played a part before. And so um, uh, folks have written about this sort of like windows of entry uh, into new industries as they emerge, where you get a whole sort of mix of new players, new organizational models, and there's really very little stability about where what it will look like in the future. And I think that's a really interesting highlight from that case, because uh, so folks here are asking over uh, in the comments about um, AI and large language models. And I think, you know, we're in that sort of flux state right now in that space. In 10 years, we're going to be having the same conversation. We're going to be looking back and saying, well, of course, this is why OpenAI or Google or some player we don't not in the conversation yet got control of the system and was able to execute a platform play appropriately. Right now, I think it's really hard to make that prediction because the scope of the opportunities and, and really where the opportunities is still so unclear. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Look, let's let's look look to the future. There's a question from uh, Yanker. I see. How do the dynamics of business ecosystems influence firm level strategies, and how do these strategies in turn reshape the broader ecosystem over, over time? Which I think is one of those um, chicken and egg and mixed up sort of questions which you tend to get around ecosystems. Um, let, let me uh, abbre abbreviate it to where, where do we eco ecosystems go next? If we're looking to the future in, in, in 10 years time, where, where do you see our understanding of ecosystems and where do you see academic research in influencing that as well? Liz, Liz is nodding helpfully. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give it a quick start at least and then maybe come back around to it on more on the future. And so I think this question, so years ago when we studied strategy and we thought about strategy, we thought about core competencies, right? And kind of what is um, what is the essence of any given firm? And I think this raises this question again of what should um, the firm itself be focused on and how is it leveraging others um, for innovation and for, for moving forward? So, and th this question of kind of what should be core and what should be peripheral, right? And what are the opportunities that are 
available to a firm because they're involved in an ecosystem. So in, in the workforce ecosystem arena that I've been studying, we've basically said from a business strategy standpoint, you can kind of flip the script and say, okay, instead of saying what's the firm level strategy and then what human capital do we need to accomplish that strategy? Instead say, what are the resources that we have access to? Human, uh, individuals, groups of individuals, and technologies, AI included, right? Given that we have access to this and, you know, then what does that mean for what we're able to accomplish? And we have a bunch of interesting examples around that. And so I think thinking much more iteratively about what are the resources in the world and what does that mean for the firm is a, a slightly different approach to strategy or maybe a fundamentally different approach to thinking about strategy. And in terms of future, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it um, later. But I, again, I think this notion of thinking well beyond an organization's boundaries in thinking in terms of how do they accomplish what they want to do with all the partners. So our sub subtitle of the book is Reaching Strategic Goals with People, Partners, and Technologies, because this notion is how to use an ecosystem to reach strategic goals with all of these resources interconnected in some reasonable way that's interesting does it diminish the firm or does it maximize the firm i don't think it needs to necessarily do either that we need to have a kind of set answer for that question because i think you know in some cases a firm may able to be smaller so for example i'll go back to utest they have a million software testers or testers, product testers around the world, they can be smaller because they have this massive community. But there's still plenty of projects, plenty of activities that require a relatively large central firm. So I don't, I'm not of the camp of this is going to mean that all firms are going to be smaller by any sense. Can I just, I mean, I think an analogy there is like, you think about any sports, right? You have, uh, so I default to basketball and you have some teams that have a great man, right? He's, uh, or, or great single woman who, who really runs the court when she's there. Um, and other teams are teams, right? And I think that fundamentally, uh, the, there are always going to be a multiplicity of ways to succeed in any competitive environment, in any business environment. And what, digital and what what ecosystem type of technologies allow us to do is it allows those teams to work more effectively. So, so you have networks that can go up head to head with single dominant players, but you're always going to have the single dominant players. I'll, I'll translate that for our soccer lovers watching. That's the, the Leo Messi effect there. Shiva. Shiva. Yeah, as I was about to build on uh, Liz's point around what role the firm would play. So if you think about strategy early on, the whole idea of firm was to control resources. And what ecosystem research or ecosystem trend has done is it basically has given out or decentralized these resources to number of firms. And now the firm's role has is shifting. It is more about orchestrating these resources. The capabilities that firms need is more about orchestration. How do I connect these resources together to create value? So the strategies that firms needs to play in terms of ecosystems is now no longer controlling resources, but more an orchestrator role in terms of connecting these resources and creating value. So there will be a shift in terms of what firms would require in order to be successful in an ecosystem world. And I would say just quickly on that, Hila Lifshitz Asaf, many years ago in her work on NASA, uh, said that the NASA scientists were moving from problem solvers to solution seekers. And that was for a very specific case, but that has always stuck with me. This notion of thinking about yourself or your organization as a solution seeker rather than a problem solver, because it means that you open the lens to where you find those solutions. And I think we continue to see that uh, across all of this work. I see there's been some questions about open source, you know, we've talked about open innovation, we talk about ecosystems, platforms, crowdsourcing, all of this, all the common theme is opening the aperture of where you find solutions, and then how you leverage those solutions for the benefit of all the stakeholders, frankly. And 
the uh, the problems we're, we're seeking to solve are the biggest problems facing mankind, as well as corporate right. raising corporate profits and market share, etc. Right. And the complexity is beyond the capabilities, I would say, of one individual person and probably one individual organization to solve. So these networks of ecosystems, these, you know, ecosystem structures serve a great purpose to harness these skills together. So where does your work go next? Shiva, what, what, what should we be looking out for from you? So my work is still continuing to look on the platform ecosystem, but now I'm also dip, doing a dipstick on the AI to understand the role of AI in the ecosystem and trying to understand with the AI, who will benefit more from the AI. And actually right now, what we are finding is that AI incumbents would still benefit from the AI because incumbents have this these capabilities of integration that the new entrants lack. So that's where I'm going. And Doug, where, where's your work going? I'm headed the opposite direction. I'm going super low tech. I am interested in these latent networks of makers and innovators and individuals out there and the role that they can play in resilient supply chains and resilient economies, which is technology enabled for sure. But at the end of the day, it's often about individuals in their garages uh, and, and workshops and craftsmen working together to produce things to alleviate local humanitarian economic social needs. So pretty much exactly the opposite direction. So, but I look forward to continuing to work with Shiva. Yeah. Well, you should talk to uh, Yanka and, and uh, craft ecosystems of crafts people. And Liz, can we expect another book? Oh, I, did, not... I didn't say, I didn't say when I didn't put the time. <laughs> At some point, maybe not in the near future. Um, actually going back to roots somewhat on the product to platform transitions. I think that's an area that I've, um, I have a paper that we're about to submit on that. Um, so I think thinking more about organizations, strategies related to platformization. So back to that earlier work, but I'm also really interested in these questions of leadership and policy. Um, so taking the workforce ecosystems work, the third part of that book is about ethics, social responsibility. I think it makes sense to kind of push on that a little bit more. Um, yeah, but I think, and, and uh, as these guys know well, I think the complementary strategy space continues to be really under researched, and we have a lot to understand about the members of the ecosystem and how this affects members of the ecosystem, and you know what their strategies are. So, I think there's still lots and lots of work to be done in all of these areas. Yeah, there's lots of work to be done. We I think we can all agree on that. We're out of time, so I'd like to say thank you to Shiva, Shiva Ag Agarwal, Doug Hanna, and Liz Altman. Really brilliant discussion. Uh, please check out uh, the, the work of, of, of all three of our, our speakers this afternoon. It's really, really important work. Uh, it makes sense of the eco ecosystems in, in really interesting ways. So thank you to you all, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks again, Stuart. Thank you, all. Thank you everyone.